I'm going to talk about recent and ongoing evolution of our of us, our the human species. And uh, it's a little bit, it's quite a contrast with uh, the origins talks that you've had so far this uh, fall. Uh, for example, talking about black holes and plate tectonics, you're talking about billions of years, uh, millions of years. Uh, when talking about my topic, uh, we're dealing with a briefer time scale. Talking about uh, the evolution of, of human species, uh, like uh, this cover from last week's Science Magazine, uh, we're talking on the order of 3.3 million years. What I'm going to focus on is uh, the time period pretty much in the last 100,000 years or so. So in the context of human evolution, uh, it counts as, as recent. And uh, then I'll also talk about some examples of natural selection ongoing at, right now as we speak. And this quote from Darwin uh, is kind of sets up the way I'd like to talk about this. And, and he talks about the fact that as a result of minute variations in structures, habits, instincts that adapt individuals to new conditions will tell upon its vigor and health. So he's telling us here that well-adapted organisms are the outcome of evolution by natural selection. The approach that I'm going to take is the approach of evolutionary medicine. And evolutionary medicine asks a really basic question. Why do diseases exist? Why hasn't natural selection eliminated disease? If natural selection produces well-adapted organisms, then isn't there some kind of uh, inconsistency here uh, that we even have disease? So I'm going to take, uh, give you a couple of examples to illustrate some basic principles of evolutionary medicine. And I'm going to talk about scurvy, which illustrates one reason uh, for vulnerability to disease. I'll talk about breast cancer. That illustrates another uh, reason for vulnerability to disease. So why are we vulnerable to scurvy? First of all, what is scurvy? We don't think about scurvy nowadays, right? Does anyone here know someone who has had scurvy? Probably not. Um, it is uh, the, it, the way we uh, would diagnose a, a case of scurvy would be bleeding gums, joints, uh, sore joints, bones, digestive tract bleeding. And, and the cause is all of these are collagen deficiencies. They're deficiencies of uh, or abnormalities. The cause of uh, scurvy is a dietary deficiency of vitamin C, such as what uh, we can get in the diet if we consume citrus fruits like this lime. Now we can ask the question in a little bit different way. Why are we vulnerable to scurvy? Well, we are vulnerable because we don't synthesize vitamin C. In fact, many organisms synthesize it. And they synthesize so much that you could actually measure vitamin C in their urine because they make more than they need and it gets excreted. But we don't do that. We, we and many other primates don't synthesize vitamin D. And the reason we don't synthesize vitamin D, I keep saying vitamin D. I mean vitamin C. Vitamin D comes next week. Uh, vitamin C is that the, there, there's a biochemical pathway for synthesizing vitamin C. And the last step in that pathway requires a certain enzyme, GULO. And we do not have active copies of that enzyme. 
So that entire biochemical pathway is active, but not that final, final step that produces vitamin C. So this is called the proximate explanation for why we are vulnerable to scurvy. It tells you the biochemical mechanism. <clears throat> we, but we want to know more. Why are we vulnerable to scurvy? And that brings us to the ultimate explanation. This is the evolutionary explanation. And the evolutionary reasoning why we and other non-human primates don't synthesize vitamin C is that historically, for the past millions of years in primate history, we have been able to obtain vitamin C in our diet. So there was abundant vitamin C. We didn't encounter difficulties of getting adequate vitamin C, and we just didn't get uh, scurvy. So what we have then is scurvy, from an evolutionary standpoint, is a result of our evolutionary legacy. We have inherited from our primate ancestors and relatives a mutation in the GULO enzyme that results in not producing this enzyme, but it made no difference under most dietary conditions because there was so much vitamin C in our diets. So it was evolutionarily neutral for many millions of years. Scurvy became a disease. It became a disease problem with extreme shifts of diet, extremely unusual food sources. And as you know, the British are called limeys. Why are the British called limeys? Because during the ship voyages, the long, long months and years of, of uh, ship voyages by the British traders, they were living on hard biscuits, they were living on dried meat um, and ale and things like that, and their teeth started to fall out, their gums started to bleed, and they developed scurvy. And this was viewed as, it was a scourge of uh, sailors on these uh, long voyages. And in the 1700s, it was discovered that limes, in fact, uh, can counteract that. Hence, limes were then packed on uh, British ships to prevent scurvy, and they did. And Brits became known as limeys. So here is one evolutionary explanation for disease, that we're vulnerable to this disease because of our evolutionary history. We can ask, why are we vulnerable to breast cancer? This is the most common cancer among women. I, there are a couple of different types of, uh, well, let's just say that. Uh, in the U.S., you know, we're, it's so common that we have Breast Cancer Awareness uh, Month. Uh, and many, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of women in the U.S. are diagnosed with breast cancer every year. Tens of thousands die from breast cancer. So we're used to thinking about breast cancer as, wow, this is a real public health problem. It's a real problem for women's health. We're not so much used to asking the question, well, gee, why do we have it in the first place? So we could ask our same questions. What is the proximate mechanism? What's the biochemical or the anatomical or cellular explanation? And the proximate mechanism for breast cancer relates to the rate of cell division in breast tissue. And cancer occurs mainly in the duct and in the lobules of the breast. And it occurs in cells that uh, line the ducts and the lobules. And factors that increase the rate of division 
of these epithelial cells increase the risk of breast cancer. A leading factor that uh, leads to this incre uh, increase in cell division is estrogen. In contrast, factors that curtail the uh, division of those cells cut the risk of breast cancer. One of these is full mature, one of these is a full pregnancy. A full pregnancy and the hormones that associate with that and with lactation actually cause a complete and adult uh, differentiation of, of these epithelial cells lining the ducts and the lobules. And so they decrease the ability to proliferate. They don't erase it, but they decrease it. Now, as I mentioned, we're used to thinking about various risk factors. Uh, women have much more breast cancer than men. Uh, it occurs mainly in women over 50 after the reproductive age, although it's more likely to be found among women who have not had children. Or if they had children, they didn't breastfeed. It's more likely to be found among women who have had hormone replacement therapy, women who are obese, women who have, uh, drink more than you know, moderately, uh, women who smoke, and uh, genetic factors also increase our risk. So we've got proximate causes, we've got risk factors to think about. We're, Genes sounds like something that we'd like to talk about because evolution by natural selection requires heritable variation. Genes, however, only account for about 5% of the breast cancers in, uh, in American women. And there are two genes in particular, BRCA1 and BRCA2. This is short for breast cancer susceptibility genes 1 and 2. And these are what are called tumor suppressor genes. We have genes like BRCA1 and BRCA2 that help to prevent our cells from excessive proliferation and excessive cell division. So the normal versions, and we all have some versions of these two genes, uh, normally what they do is they maintain stability of DNA and they maintain the normal uh, rate of growth and cell division uh, in, in cells. When they're mutated, they are not as good as containing the, uh, the rate of proliferation. And in particular, these two genes respond to estrogen surges by increasing the, allowing an increase in the rate of proliferation. So these are the two main uh, genes that account for uh, the bulk of hereditary forms of uh, breast cancer. There are other genes that call, uh, that account for a small number of cases. Some populations have particularly high frequencies of the mutated forms of BRCA1 and BRCA2. For example, Ashkenazi Jews are people with a high frequency of, this, of the mutant form of these genes. And, and among Ashkenazi Jews, if we were to do a population survey, we would find about one in 40 people have a, a mutant form. Whereas in the larger, let's say, US population or European population, it's on the order of one in 400 or one in 800 have mutant copies. <clears throat> and, and so that would be our Eastern European uh, Ashkenazi Jew, Jewish population. And then uh, our Northern European population in general from Denmark, Holland, Iceland, they have very high rates of a different mutation still of the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. 
So now what we've got is we have to think about a particular tumor suppressor gene, mutations. There's a certain set of mutations that characterized East European populations in high frequency. These are the same genes. I shouldn't have used different genes. A certain set of mutant, mutated forms in Ashkenazi Jews and a certain form of mutated BRCA1 and, and BRCA2 genes in uh, the Norwegian and Icelandic populations. Now, the big question is, how do you know whether you have a mutated form? There are uh, tests. There are, are specific genetic tests that you can request that uh, will uh, identify whether you have one of these mutated forms. They are a patented test. So uh, no matter where you get the test, have the test done, the analysis is done in Utah at a company called Myriad Genetics. And it takes a special test to identify whether, uh, since there are many mutations, the tests have to be specifically designed to pick up let's say, the mutations that are common in European populations, the mutations that are common in Ashkenazi Jews. Since we cannot manufacture uh, vitamin C, do you envision in the future, through genetic changes, that eventually we will be able to make our own vitamin C and D and some of the other essential amino acids? Probably not, because it really does take a pretty extreme diet to be vitamin C deficient. And also because we take supplements and so forth nowadays. So uh, one, there's a fair amount of vitamin C in our diet. A lot of foods are supplemented in the Western world where we eat manufactured foods and processed foods. And even in the rest of the world where people don't uh, use processed foods, they get uh, vitamin C from their diet. And I can give you an example from my own research uh, with Tibetan nomads who eat no fresh fruits and no fresh vegetables. And I spent a long time trying to figure out how, a di how their diet could possibly have allowed them to not have scurvy. I kept thinking, you guys must have scurvy. You guys must have scurvy. But, but they, they didn't. There were no signs of it. And finally, digging through old, old literature, I learned that, one, they're getting from fresh milk. They drink, they eat yogurt made from fresh milk. Fresh milk has small amounts of vitamin C. It's excreted by the cows that synthesize vitamin C. They're all, they were also getting uh, vitamin C from fresh meat, again. The animals make vi vitamin C, and there was some in the meat. So there's an example of an extreme diet, but it's a diet in a population that's been eating that diet for a long time, and they are eating enough of small sources of vitamin C. So for that reason, I figure we'll stay like we are. So now we need to consider the evolutionarily, or the ultimate, explanation for the vulnerability to breast cancer. And here we contrast what we uh, anthropologists like to talk about, the Paleolithic lifestyle, and contrast it with the Neolithic lifestyle and the modern lifestyle. <clears throat> so the Paleolithic era of human evolution refers to the time period when we were using stone tools, hence the term Paleolithic. And we were following a hunting and gathering way of life. That is, we didn't have fields. We didn't have grocery stores. We didn't have towns. We didn't have villages. We lived by having an intimate knowledge of our environment and of the plants and the animals available, and by hunting them and gathering them, eating a wide range of foods. And that of uh, many other features of lifestyle went along with the Paleolithic or hunting and gathering way of life. We talk about the Neolithic in, as the time since we started domesticating plants and animals. As we started domesticating plants and animals, 
our diets changed, our way of life changed, our pattern of living changed. And, and this, this was a major uh, change of environment. And as we know from evolutionary theory, we would expect a major change of environment to exert very different uh, selective pressures. Now, the adoption of agriculture is not the only thing that distinguishes us modern women from you know, our Paleolithic ancestors. You know, we've undergone urbanization, sedentarization, industrialization, modernization, all kinds of isations. And, and we'll look at them uh, as well. Uh, so we, to go back to some of these proximate causes, it's very high estrogen levels of pregnancy and lactation decrease susceptibility to breast cancer by stimulating cell differentiation. So this is a review of what I said before. And, and this is important because this cell differentiation removes some of the cells that would otherwise be vulnerable to uh, uncontrolled proliferation. Nursing, in turn, further slows proliferation. So what I'm getting to is I'm starting to move towards our evolutionary explanation. And our evolutionary explanation for why we modern women are vulnerable to breast cancer is that we are exposed in our reproductive lifetimes to much more estrogen than our Paleolithic ancestors. So this table contrasts the reproductive career of Paleolithic women as we have reconstructed it using modern, still living women who are living a Paleolithic lifestyle with uh, us today in the US. I'm using us as an example of modern women, you know, modern women in urban areas in the US, in Europe, Japan, and so forth. First of all, the age at menarche. This is the age at the first menstrual cycle. So this is the age at which women start being exposed to monthly surges in estrogen. In our evolutionary past, women probably experienced menarche at around 16 or 17 years. Now that's hardly imaginable in our society now, where uh, the median age at menarche is that is, 50% of girls have undergone menarche by 12 or 13. It, and in our ancestral environment, it, it, we didn't do that until uh, the age of 16 or 17. Furthermore, the, uh, in the Paleolithic, women on the average were having their first child at around the age of 20. So, and nowadays, uh, in the US, at any rate, the average age for giving birth to our first child is 26 years. So we're having our first kids later. We're experiencing menarche earlier. So there's a, time, a longer time period between menarche and first birth where we're being exposed to the monthly surges of estrogen. Breastfeeding duration. Women were breastfeeding three and four years. And during that time period, there is a suppression of ovulation, as long as breastfeeding was regular. Despite a lot of attempts and efforts to get women to breastfeed uh, in, the, you know, in contemporary US, the average is still in the order of, of just a few months. So the suppression of ovulation during uh, breastfeeding is much shorter in our time. And women return to ovular, ovulatory status uh, much faster. Women during the Paleolithic had on the average of six kids. So you have six kids, it's a lot more kids, a lot more time during pregnancy when you're not ovulating. 
women in the U.S. have on the average of around two kids. The age at which we stop ovulating, the age at menopause, the median was 47 years for uh, women in the Paleolithic. That is, half the women by the age of 47 were no longer menstruating. In our own society, it's 50-51. So you can see that all of this adds up to a very different reproductive career, if you will, for Paleolithic women. These are, and we've lived this way for millions of years. Natural selection really honed our reproductive careers in this Paleolithic context. This context is in the past century or so for, uh, for us. So as a consequence, we are nowadays exposed to much more estrogen. We ovulate more during our lifetimes. There is a surge of estrogen for each one of those. There is the opportunity to stimulate proliferation of the, uh, the uh, division of, of these epithelial cells. And so this is just an illustration that we've all seen since about, what, fourth grade of the uh, surge in estrogen throughout the menstrual cycle and, if, and its effect on the uterine lining and the proliferation in the uterine lining. Yeah, we want the proliferation there, but we don't want the proliferation to be uncontrolled and in breast tissue. So the estimate is that uh, our Paleolithic ancestresses may have ovulated as, as few as uh, 160, some estimates even say as few as 100 times in their life cycle, as, as compared to an estimated 450 ovulations for, in a lifetime for uh, U.S. women. Similarly, we, modern women, have fewer pregnancies, and we breastfeed for fewer times. So if you consider the Paleolithic woman with six babies, three years of breastfeeding, let's just assume she was anovulatory for those uh, full three years, that she had 18 years without ovulating. And the modern woman did may get, as a result of, of reproduction, about a half a year. So big difference. Other known risk factors for breast cancer are also associated with many ovulations. Uh, early menarche, late age at first birth, late age at menopause. Now, we also, I also mentioned lifestyle factors as being important. Nutritional factors we know uh, can increase the risk. Dietary fat promotes the risk. Well, the modern diet contains a higher proportion of fat and a different type of fat. If we look at the Paleolithic diet, women were eating fat. They were getting fat from wild game. They were getting fat from nuts. They were getting fat from fatty vegetables and fruits. So it was a different source of fat, less of it. Dietary fiber is protective. The estimates of the amount of dietary fiber per day in the Paleolithic ranges from 40 to 50 grams per day. The recommendation nowadays in the U.S. is 25 grams a day, and most people don't even make our modern recommendation. So the, Paleolith the change in diet since then uh, is another factor that contributes to our increased risk. Alcohol drinking promotes risk. In the Paleolithic, we didn't drink alcohol. In order to have alcohol, what do you have to have? You have to have large quantities of something, like f sweet, f to, and a vessel to put it in, and time to sit there while it ferments. And we didn't have that during the Paleolithic. We only invented pottery uh, and grains uh, later on. Obesity, um, all of the studies of modern day uh, women, 
following the hunting and gathering life uh, find, don't find any obesity. We were active. We were uh, eating a different type of diet. Smoking was rare. It was ceremonial if they did it. Exercise is debated as to whether exercise in the modern context uh, can protect against uh, breast cancer or not. Exercise levels were definitely higher uh, during the Paleolithic. The, uh, on the, estimate, uh, the estimate is that women were expending around uh, 3,000 calories a day, which is a lot higher than the estimated 2,000 calories per day RDA from, uh, from the US uh, government. <clears throat> so we can think of why are we vulnerable to breast cancer in terms of we, what we're doing now is we're now living in an evolutionarily mismatched environment. It's, it's basically a new environment for our, our human biology. And the major mismatch is the marked change in reproductive behavior. It's created a novel endocrine environment, if you will, that differs from the endocrine environment in which we evolved for millions of years. We've lost protective factors as a result. Uh, the protective factors we've lost are the multiple pregnancies, the long breastfeeding, late uh, age at menarche. The novel risks we've gained include more exposure to the carcinogenic effects of sex hormones and less of the protective factors of diet. Going back to that chart, um, the Paleolithic era would be 10,000 years or more back. Um, you gave all kinds of different statistics. How do we know that? What, what do we have to show that they didn't write? Good question. Thank you for asking it. And we know that because nowadays there are still living small groups of people continuing to follow the, hunt, uh, the Paleolithic lifestyle. Examples of this include the Bushmen of South Africa, the Hadza of East Africa, Australian Aborigines. Uh, they include Eskimos, uh, Inuit. They include uh, Hiwi of South America. And so anthropologists have spent a lot of time. You can imagine that we find them extremely valuable because they're essentially uh, you know, a, a natural laboratory for us to go and study what was it like to live that kind of lifestyle? What do you do when you don't have fields, when you are living with basically stone tools? And so when we do that, that's how we get the evidence. And thank you for asking the questions. It's an important one. Also, modern day, I should say that nowadays, only a few people are living that lifestyle. And they're living in marginal environments because they're, they've been outcompeted by agriculturalists. And so it's very extremely impressive that they've been able to hang on in these marginal environments, like uh, deserts and sub-deserts and, and so forth. Assuming that, uh, you know, we had uh, our lifestyles were hunter-gatherers back then, right? Yeah. Um, assuming there was the uh, occasional saber-toothed tiger that grabbed a few people, how, how long did these people live, our females? What was the lifespan? It depends on the age at which you calculate the average lifespan. If you calculate the average lifespan at birth, and the average lifespan would just be the average age of death, right? So the average age at death, uh, which would be the average lifespan at birth, uh, you know, is in the 40s. OK, so you say, well, wait a minute. Did women last, live long enough to develop breast cancer? Well, one of the things about that measure, the average uh, age at death, is that it includes infant mortality. And infant mortality was relatively high. You know, it could have been in the order. It varies from population to population. But it could be, in some cases, as high as 10, 20, 30%. But if we wait and we start, OK, 
what is the likelihood of a woman, if she lives to the age of menarche, of her living you know, into her 40s, 50s, and 60s? And then you see that probably a third of women did live into their 50s and 60s. So they lived long enough to become vulnerable to breast cancer. Is there a reason why women um, ovulated later, like 16, as opposed to 12? Better food is probably one of them, because uh, what we see, uh, looking at, again, looking at modern populations, we, we see that uh, we're getting more food, we're attaining a larger body size sooner. Uh, there's an anthropologist who has done measurements all over the world to try to see what is the key factor that's associated with age at menarche. And it's hip width, bony hip width, not fatty hip width, uh, but bony hip width. And, and so with better nutrition, we grow bigger and we achieve larger size at earlier age, including larger hip width. And uh, that's the thing that then triggers uh, other factors, or it's highly correlated with other factors. In fact, we can look at records for European populations and American populations and see that in the 1700s, in our own society, the median age at menarche was 16 or 17. It's been decreasing steadily over the last few centuries. So it's very vulnerable to nutrition. I thought going back even 100, 200 years ago, young women were marrying at, at much earlier ages and bearing children at much earlier ages. It depends on where you're talking about in the world. And also some women were being married before they were fully reproductive. You know, they, if you had a median age, this was a median age, right? I, I just pointed to the screen, which is blank. The median age was 16, 17. So that means that half of the girls had achieved menarche before then. So there were some girls you know, who were better nourished, who had achieved earlier menarche. They could have gotten married and had kids. But still, there was a big chunk of them that could have gotten married early and wouldn't have been fertile. And our next question, from uh, the standpoint of looking at evolution by natural selection in modern human populations, is why are some populations vulnerable to sickle cell anemia? Sickle cell anemia, uh, we know it as a genetic disease. Here in the US, you have to inherit two copies of a mutant form of hemoglobin in order to have sickle cell anemia. When we're thinking about why are some populations vulnerable to sickle cell anemia, not only do we have to think about us, the human populations, but we have to think about two other organisms and their evolution. One is Anopheles mosquitoes. This is a female Anopheles mosquito taking a blood meal. She's got a red tummy here from a person. And this is a malaria plasmodium. So we need to think about people, plasmodia, and mosquitoes in order to answer this question, why are some populations vulnerable to sickle cell anemia? And this is the classic example of evolution and adaptation in, in modern human populations. And it starts with scientists in the 1950s, or the explanation starts with scientists in the 1950s who observed that there were two deadly blood disease in sub-Saharan Africa and, and other parts of the old world that shared a, a geographic distribution. And this is the historical distribution of malaria, sub-Saharan Africa, circum uh, Mediterranean, in through the Middle East, and India. 
The second blood disease, another deadly blood disease, was found in the uh, basically the same geographic area. And that was sickle cell anemia. And the prevalence of the mutant form of hemoglobin that uh, causes sickle cell anemia is mapped here. The darkest purple are the areas with the highest frequencies, lighter purple, lighter purple, lower and lower frequency until we get to white, where it's, you know, it's essentially only found as a very rare mutation. So they started with this observation. Malaria continues to be a problem today. Um, it's even more widespread. Now we find it in the New World. We find it throughout Africa. We find it in more countries uh, in this uh, corridor connecting uh, to Western Asia and uh, throughout Eastern Asia. If we think about malaria from the standpoint of evolution by natural selection, we have, an, we have to ask the question, is everyone who gets malaria equally likely, I, refer, I said that wrong, is everyone exposed to malaria equally likely to get sick? The answer is no. Is everyone exposed and who gets sick equally likely to die? The answer is no. Malaria has acted and continues to act as an agent of natural selection in human populations. And an important thing again here is that it's our own activities since the Neolithic Revolution that contribute to the conditions that allow malaria to flourish. The proximate cause is the mutant form of normal hemoglobin. So hemoglobin A and hemoglobin S are variants of hemoglobin at the same locus. They result from different mutations at a single pair of nucleotides. Among the three billion nucleotides that we have in our genome, one mutation at a particular place results in individuals. If you inherit two copies of this, there's a blood smear. This was the original uh, publication over 100 years ago illustrating the sickled form of red blood cells containing uh, hemoglobin S. The three variants, so we've got two variants of hemoglobin that leads us to have three different genotypes. We can be homozygous for the normal hemoglobin. We can be heterozygous for AS, in which case we say an individual has sickle cell trait. Or we can be heterozygous for hemoglobin S, in which case an individual has sickle cell anemia. So we can then ask our question, are people equally likely to get malaria and are people equally likely to die from malaria depending upon their hemoglobin genotype? And, and the answer is no. The, Susceptibility to falciparum malaria, one particular form of malaria, is very high among people with uh, the A, A genotype, which is probably most of us, if not all of us, here in this room. People with the AS genotype have a lower probability of getting malaria if they get it, they have a milder case, and they're less likely to die from malaria than people with this genotype. People with the SS genotype 
are still have a very low likelihood of getting the disease. They have a low likelihood, they would have a low likelihood of dying from it. However, they, at least before there was modern medicine, they rarely lived long enough to actually get malaria and die from that. That was because they had a very high, almost universal, death rate due to sickle cell anemia. Without modern medicine, an individual who is born hemoglobin SS has a very low likelihood of surviving to reproductive age. The other two variants, the hemoglobin AS and hemoglobin AA individuals didn't have uh, mortality due to sickle cell anemia. So we can look at what is called the evolutionary fitness. We can say, gee, which genotype in a malarial environment has the highest probability of surviving to reproduction, reproductive age, and having kids? And that's the heterozygote. So let's give that a fitness of one. Of course, heterozygotes are dying from a variety of things, but they have the highest chance of surviving. So we're saying that they have a fitness of one. Relative to them, the fitness of the hemoglobin AA hemoglo uh, homozygotes was lower. It's about two thirds. Relative to the AS heterozygotes, the SS individuals had essentially a fitness of zero. So wait a minute. They had a fitness of zero, yet there is a prevalence. About 2% of the births in Nigeria, for example, are people with uh, babies of hemoglobin SS who have, sickle, who have sickle cell anemia. So why? Why is it still around if it has such a low fitness? Well, the answer is this heterozygote advantage. Heterozygotes, remember, have one mutant allele and one normal allele. Well, the only way to get a mutant allele is by inheriting it or inheriting a very rare mutation. But in this case, there's no, we don't know of any mutation rate in the world that would give us 2% of, uh, of hom homozygotes. So several factors are maintaining this, uh, this it's called a balanced polymorphism. Both alleles are kept in the population because there is a balance between the fitness costs to hemoglobin A individuals for having high malaria and the fitness costs of hemoglobin SS individuals who are dying from sickle cell anemia. There's the physical environment. It occurs, it, the mutation has occurred and has increased in frequency in tropical environments. It's incurred in, popula in populations in these tropical environments where people are practicing agriculture. What does agriculture do? You till the soil, you do so near water, you create breeding pools for mosquitoes. Wait a minute, why do we need mosquitoes? We need mosquitoes because mosquitoes transmit the infectious agent, the plasmodium, from one person to the next. So we farm. We increase the breeding population, the breeding habitats for mosquitoes. There are more mosquitoes. We farm, we settle down. We farm, population increases. We've got more people, more mosquitoes, more vulnerability, more people for the mosquitoes to bite and to transmit mos uh, malaria from one person to the next. 
we have a lot of responses to this. Uh, nowadays, in modern society, we have many responses to this situation. We say, well, OK. Do we simply say, oh, that's natural selection. It's natural. We'll let it happen. Yeah, we try really hard. Modern medicine, you may be thinking, but wait, aren't we interfering with natural selection? Yes. That's what modern medicine tries to do. That's OK. We understand some of the proximate mechanisms whereby the AS heterozygotes have higher survival rates. Red blood cells, as you know, circulate, they carry oxygen. Hemoglobin S containing red blood cells move to the edge of the blood vessels. They give up their oxygen. So they give up their oxygen. That causes them to the hemoglobin to assume an abnormal shape. It basically becomes kind of like a, a, a crystal. And the cells uh, get this sickle shape. And they come to the little tiny capillaries and the branches in the little capillaries. And they have a hard time getting through. They don't deform the way our normal uh, red blood cells do. You can think of our, our red blood cells as little baggies of hemoglobin. And so that the baggie uh, model gives you an idea that they're very deformable, right? And, but the sickled hemoglobin and the sickled cells aren't so. So they get stuck. You know, there's a backup. They burst. They release plasmodia. Our bloodstream, our antibodies, and, and our immune system has a better chance of taking uh, or removing those plasmodia. So we have the, someone with sickle cell anemia has many fewer red blood cells. With, I'm sorry, it has many fewer plasmodia. Also has fewer red blood cells, and therefore is anemic. The ultimate explanation for why we are vulnerable to, uh, or why we have some populations have very high levels of uh, hemoglobin S, is natural selection. Natural selection is simply the differential survival of genotypes in an environment. So we've got three genotypes, normal hemoglobin, heterozygote for sickle cell, homozygote, sickle cell anemia, with different chances of survival. In order to have heterozygotes, you have to have transmission of that S allele. And if two heterozygotes marry, as you saw on the first slide, the chances are one in four that they will have an offspring with sickle cell anemia. So that is a cost of the protection afforded to the heterozygotes. So those populations living in an environment with falciparum malaria, only falciparum malaria, with a high prevalence of hemoglobin S, have a survival advantage. They are adapted to that environment. This is a classic example of evolution by natural selection. And it illustrates some important concepts. One is that it does not produce perfection. There are costs. There are trade-offs. People with hemoglobin S, people with sickle cell anemia are painfully, literally painfully aware. So some populations are vulnerable to sickle cell anemia because of evolution by natural selection. So we've illustrated human evolution using three examples. Scurvy as an example of an evolutionary legacy, breast cancer as an example of novel environment, and falciparum malaria and sickle cell anemia as an example of natural selection. So this is how evolutionary medicine is one way to think about human evolution by asking, why has it not eliminated disease? So next week, we're going to continue to talk about why are we vulnerable to certain diseases. And we're going to focus on the last 10,000 years of human evolution, in which time we adopted new diets, 
that have caused vulnerability to new diseases. We have been exposed to diseases, infectious diseases, we were never exposed to before, like malaria. Well, let me rephrase that. We were exposed to malaria, but not much. And we've been exposed to new physical environments. And the one that I, is my favorite environment to talk about is high altitude. And we'll talk about how evolution has occurred at high altitude. Thank you very much. We'll have questions during dinner. <laughs>